Hey everybody, welcome to ETC's Research and Development Headquarters here in Middleton, Wisconsin. I'm Nick Gonsman, this is The Bear Pit, and we're here to talk to you about EOS 3.0. We have a lot of exciting features to go over, so why don't we head into the studio first, and then we'll come back here to spend some time with Augmented. The first series of features that we want to take a look at in 3.0 are additions to the offset tool. I'm going to go ahead and grab a large range of channels and go into my offset menu. And you can see we have a new graphic that will indicate the pattern of the channels that offset is going to give you. It isn't necessarily indicative of each individual channel, uh, but it'll show you an idea of how these channels are falling into place. So for example, if I were to set my channels per group to be five, you can see I get my subgroups displayed to the right and I have some steps that are in my graphic. Uh, if I were to mirror those in, it gives me that step as well. One of the other additions is to be able to add multiple mirrors in my channel selection. So I'm just gonna back this off and I'm gonna go ahead and say mirror in four and you will see that this gives us four clusters of uh, channels that are mirroring in. Uh, you'll notice that as we step through, we're going through each individual set of channels. And if you look at our subgroups, that's indicative of that. Oftentimes what we really want is to add an interleave and that's going to give us enough subgrouping where four mirrors are all running together. A couple of other additions to the offset tool we now have an invert selection that we can use with jump. So for example, if I have channel 701 through 800 and I jump every fifth channel, you'll notice that I'm selecting a channel with a five channel gap in between. If I use invert, that's going to grab all of the channels that were not selected. And it's good to note that this is a function that works exclusively with jump. And finally, the other feature that's been added to offset is your order from group. I can put a channel selection on the command line and then get the order from the group as it's recorded. So for example, if I clear this command line really quick and I look at my group list display, group 328 has my psych pixels in a vertical order. You can see that I have 701, 709, 717, et cetera. So back out in live, if I grab 701 through 800, offset, order from group 328, you can see that I actually get the channel selection in the order that they're stored in that group. And this is useful because it allows you to have fewer groups overall. You can use one master group that contains all of your order for a scenic object or a grid wall, and you can use the order from group to select portions of that without having to record separate groups. Another way that we've expanded offset is allowing you to use offset on queue selection. So I'm gonna clear my command line. I'm gonna go ahead and say queues one through 20, and I can use my offset soft key, and I'm gonna offset these to grab every third queue. You can see that grabs every third queue from my queue list, and now I can do things like change times, add labels, or whatever other modifications I'd like to make. If you were using multi-cell channels, we have another subgroup tool that's useful. I'm gonna grab my psych fixtures, which are 301 through 312. And if I have cells only on the command line, and then I hit group, you'll notice that my cells only will change to group cells. And if I record that as group 401, what I'm going to get is all of my cells per channel subgrouped. So if I look at my group group, you can see that I have channels 301 in a subgroup with just the cells, 302 with just the cells, et cetera. So this is a really quick and easy way to make subgroups for all of my cells. Another addition to 3.0 is we're allowing you to see your channel order when you're working with a group on the command line, and that's gonna display in your messages area. So for example, if I type group 101 and hit at, you'll notice in my messages area, I get the channel selection order and that's gonna help me know what's going on within that group as I work with it. For this next example, I'm gonna clear off my command line and I'm going to go into format so I can see my channel table display. We are now allowing you to copy individual parameters to multiple parameters. So I'm gonna put channel 103 at full and I'm gonna say uh, cyan 
at 50. If I wanted to copy that to other parameters, I can simply say cyan, copy to magenta and yellow, enter, and they're going to take the value of 50 as well. And this can go across parameters and across channel selection. You can also use this with the recall from command. Let's take a look at some of the graphical additions to EOS 3.0. One of the first things that we'll look at is the ability to expand your fader ribbon. So any product that has a built-in touchscreen with built-in faders has the ability now to expand the fader ribbon. This will show you the ribbon that's been displaying on our GeoAt5 hardware, as well as our motorized fader wing hardware. And it just gives you a bit more detail about the properties of the content that's loaded to each fader. You'll be able to open it by touching the up arrow above your page display. And if you want to close that and collapse it back down to a summary ribbon, you can hit the down arrow and that collapses it. The state of your fader ribbon is also stored in your snapshots, so keep that in mind as you play your snapshots back. In our about area, we've added some additional information for palettes and presets in particular. So I'm gonna go ahead and say color palette 9025. The first thing you'll notice is that we have changed uh, from our standard buttons for navigation to section buttons. So if you're looking for usage and current values, you can toggle between those section buttons up here. But you'll notice that we have additional information for palettes and presets, which include things like channels that are using that palette, channels that are not using it, cues that move into this palette, effects stored in preset, and sub-information. So this gives you a really good overview of where your content's being used in your show file. In our color picker area, we've added some new reference information. So I'm gonna go ahead and open my color picker. In both of your CIE color spaces, you'll get a button for Rec. 709 and Rec. 2020, and these are video standards. When you enable them, it will show you the gamut of that space on top of your color picker. You can have one or both of them enabled at the same time, and it just gives you a little bit more reference as you're working with video. We've added a whole bunch of new things in Magic Sheets, so let's go take a look at all of those. I'm gonna open a Magic Sheet tab, and for now, I'm just gonna start a new magic sheet. When I bring in a new object, I can make all of the standard changes that I'm used to, uh, including changing this to be something like a channel. And I wanna make that be channel 101. I'd like to link the background color of that to target color and target intensity, so it changes. And I'm gonna customize a few of my fields And once I've created an object that I'm happy with, I have a few things that I can now do that are different from previous versions of software. With that item selected, the first thing I can do is find my interactive checkbox. This is on by default, and just like Magic Sheets have always operated, if I interact with that object, you can see that I get channel 101 on the command line, and I can bring that to pull and put it at a color and that all is command line interactive. But sometimes there are things that I don't want to be interactive, I just want them to be display. So with that object selected, if I uncheck interactive, I now can't interact with that object and it's display only. Interactive can be done in your Magic Sheet editor on an object by object basis, or in your settings area, you have the ability to make everything on the magic sheet be interactive or not. Again, by default, this is checked. You can uncheck it, and nothing on the magic sheet will be able to be interacted with. For now, I'm gonna click that back on. Sometimes you also want to replace the object that is representing your channel. So near the top of our properties editor, we have a new button called change type. And change type is going to allow you to change just the graphical symbol and it will retain all of the other information about that object. So for example, if I didn't want it to be a channel tile, but now wanted to change it to a fixture type, I could do that, and all of the properties, including my field, my line weight, my linked color background is retained, and just my shape has changed. For a long time, I've been able to link my channels to the target color and the target intensity, 
And we're now allowing you to show snapshots and macros in a similar way where we will display the flag color that you have attached to them. So really quickly, let's go look at our macro editor. I'm gonna hit macro macro. In my macro window, each of my macros has a field that is color, and that will be the color that displays on physical buttons as well as on my direct selects. I'm gonna go ahead and change 101's color to be green. And back in my magic sheet editor, I'm gonna make an object and I'm gonna make it macro 101. And I'm going to set its background link to target color. And now that's going to display whatever color that field is for that macro. If I go back into my macro editor, for example, and change my color to be red, back in my magic sheet, that object has updated to red. And this works for snapshots as well. We've given you the ability to make objects be soft keys. So again, I'm gonna put another object in there. And in my target area near the bottom, I have a field called soft key. And what I get is the ability to set it as soft key one through six or more soft keys. And I'm gonna leave that as soft key one for now. And when I close that, you'll see that it'll change depending on what's actually on my soft keys. So if I type channel 101, that soft key will change to what is channel specific. And you can see that it matches my actual soft keys. So it's now easy to build a magic sheet section that duplicates your soft keys. We also give you the ability to show a cell as a field now. So I'm gonna go ahead and add another object. I'm gonna make this channel 301.1. And that is the first cell of one of my cyclite light fixtures. So it's gonna display that as my channel target ID, but sometimes I just want my cell displayed. So I'm gonna change my channel target ID to be cell, and that's gonna show me the number one, which is just my cell number. So if I'm constructing a bunch of these together, I can maybe have my channel number off to the side and each individual cell numbered. Some other things worth noting in Magic Sheets. If you have a channel that has a mechanical dowser and you now link to target intensity, we take the contribution of that mechanical dowser into account. We also now allow you to create a grid array of up to a thousand by a thousand objects. A few other objects we've added in Magic Sheets. If you have an analog IO gateway, we now have an object that will monitor the real-time status of your relay on the network. We've also added an object which is a timecode clock and this will allow you to set and see whatever timecode list you're monitoring. So if, for example, I wanna monitor list 12, I can type that in, and now that will show me the status of list 12 at all times. That's it for Magic Sheets. Let's go look at pixel mapping. So in our pixel map editor, we have a few things that are just for convenience purposes. I'm gonna go ahead and add a pixel map here, just number two. Uh, I've always had to add a server channel and my layer channels in this screen and then go into patch and add those there as well. However, now when I define a channel in these areas, it's going to automatically patch them for me. So if I say server channel 551 and I go into my patch area, you can see that's automatically added that as a virtual server. Back into my pixel maps, I'm going to make my media layers, the 552 and 553. And for my effects channel layers, I'm gonna go ahead and say 554 and 555. In 2.9, we put in a new tab selection display, which simplifies the layout. Uh, we maintain the separation between displays and controls by default. So tabs that you are going to look at versus tabs that you are going to interact with. And each of these subsections is alphabetized, so it's a lot easier to find a tab that you're not constantly going for. I have a couple of different sort options if I'd like. If I hit my displays and controls, I can do all displays. That removes the delineation between displays tabs and controls tabs and alphabetizes them in a single list. If I hit on classic, this will put them in the sorting they were on the classic larger tiles. So for now, I prefer the displays and controls. And to close this out without actually opening a tab, I can hit my close button. 
some other improvements in my display management. When I split a screen, I'll now have the ability on a blank frame to go in and add a tab. And at the top center, you'll notice that the frame is highlighted. So that indicates which portion of the monitor behind this menu that I'm actually working on. So I'm going to pick a magic sheet. And again, if I want to manage this window, I can just go into my add a tab, set everything back to a single frame, and that puts all of my tabs in one frame on the monitor. A long time request has been the ability to reorder tabs in a frame on a monitor, and we've given you that ability. So if I press and hold a tab, I can now drag it along and put those tabs in whatever order I want them to be. We've added a few more functions into our effect editor. So I'm going to pop into effect really quick. I'm going to start a new effect and make it absolute. One of the things that is new to absolute effects is the ability to use a build attribute. So in our attributes area, we now have build. And build has been a function that was in step-based effects for a very long time. And it basically says that the board should play step one, then add the content of step two, add the content of step three, uh, et cetera. And then at the end, turn all the steps off and start the process over again. And this has been added to absolute effects and is pretty convenient for getting some interesting looks on stage. Like many of these attributes, build is a toggle. So if I touch it again, I will turn that off. The second attribute is break mode, and this is an absolute effect only attribute. Going back out to my actions, what break mode enables is if your channel selection is larger than the amount of actions in your effect, the behavior will be set that every channel will play through each action and then rest in the last action until the last channel of that selection goes into the effect and then everything restarts. So a quick example of this would be taking uh, a long white truss uh, that's maybe at a commercial event and rippling a blue color palette uh, in each fixture down the truss. So really simply, I can take my action one and make that color palette 9033, which is uh, my blue color palette. And what that's going to allow me to do with this effect is the first channel will play action one uh, which is my color palette blue. It will then play action two, which restores to the background, which is white. And then it's going to sit in the background until all of the channels have had a chance to go through. So the uh, result of that will be that all of my channels will stay white until the last channel has turned blue. Uh, then it will play the last step and it will rerun the effect. This is a pretty powerful attribute. So go ahead and have a play and see how it can work for you. In 3.0, we also allow you to have a bit more control over your random. The way that our random has always worked is we want a predictable random. So whenever you apply an effect for the first time, we were rolling a, a die in the background, a random number generator. And if you stored that effect, we were storing that random number with the effect. The idea being that it was random, but as you played it back night to night, it would play back the same way. Previously, if you wanted to re-roll or have a different random, you could stop that effect and reapply it. We would then pick another random number, and if you stored that, we would store it with the cue and the effect. We now give you the ability to have true random and to audition various randoms so that you can pick the one that you like the best. So I'm going to get an effect with a few more steps in here. So I'm just going to look at my effect 401. Five channels, five steps, pretty easy. When I open my attributes area and I select one of the randoms, I'm going to select random group. And you'll notice that with that enabled, I now have a random modifier button that has appeared. So I'm going to touch random modifier. If I select continuously random, that means that every time the effect plays back, it's going to select a different random. So this is a way for me to get true random in a stored effect in the console. You can also select a random modifier, and you're presented with a host of options that you can either touch the tile or type in a number. You can use anything from 1 to 9,999 to pick a random modifier. So for now, I'm just going to pick 9. And that will allow me to preserve my random between effects. So for example, if I have the same number of steps 
uh, in two different effects and I pick the same random modifier, it will be the same random between those two effects. Uh, I can also modify this in live and that will allow me to audition different randoms. So for example, we could say, let's look at random modifier one. No, let's look at four. No, let's look at 12. I like four the best. Let's go with that. This allows you a bit more predictability and exposes what random we're using under the hood. So give it a play and let us know what you think. Another place where we've improved effects is out in live. So out in live, I'm gonna go ahead and say channel 101, effect 901, and I'm gonna run that effect there. And as soon as I have effect 901 on the command line, you'll notice that my encoders give me all of my Q level overrides. As I move my encoder wheels, I'm changing some things like the rate or the size or my form. And I can use my encoder buttons to actually get that parameter on the command line. So you can see I touched rate, I can put that at 50, and now that's at a rate of 50%. So this is all designed to make queue level overrides and effects that much more efficient. If I clear my command line, my encoders go back to parameter control. The other thing that exists in your encoder area is some new behavior with shutter controls. I'm gonna pop into my shutter area. When using framing shutters in a moving light, it's often the case that I will push in a shutter and set an angle that I like, which is aligned with some scenery or other objects. Uh, but then if I go to thrust in even further, it may break that angle. And so EOS has preserved the ability for you to thrust in and out without breaking the angle that's been set. In current software, we give you an override to that function. So if you hit your exceed limits button, that's going to allow you to continue to push your thrust in, although it may change the angle of your shutter. In our fixture library editor, we have one major addition. So I'm gonna go into patch. Whenever you patch a fixture from the library, we copy that profile into your show file. And the intention of that is we want to make sure that your show file plays back the same every time, even if the library gets updated underneath the show file. So in our fixtures area, we get a list of all of the fixture profiles that are stored in our current show file. If you see a profile with an asterisk next to it, it means that there is a profile that is different in the show file than is in our base library. You have an update profile soft key, and that will replace the profile that's in the show file with the one that's in the library. You have to be very cautious with this because this could cause your show to play back differently. If you have a long running production and you're doing some maintenance or you're about to take a production on tour, we now have an update all profile button and that will go through all of your profiles and replace the ones that are in the show file with the ones that are in the library. Again, this is exceedingly easy, so be very, very careful because it can change your playback. It is also not able to be undone. So for now, I'm gonna hit cancel. Some other things in the fixture profile area to note that pertain to augmented. You'll notice my Solaframe 1000 has a 3D symbol next to it, and that means that it is an augmented calibrated profile. Uh, I also have a new area called physical data. And if I go in there, that allows me to change the focus offset of my X, Y, and Z coordinates to reflect the physical details of my fixture. For more information about this stuff, check out our augmented education series. If you exit to the shell in your settings area, we now have a function that allows you to switch between EOS 3.0 and further software back to EOS 2.91 software. There are some products that are not going to be able to install 3.0 on them, and so if you have a console that needs to go back and forth between systems, this is a great way to make sure you can do that. Once you click on this button to go back, the console will want you to reboot. So if you'd like to do that, go ahead and hit OK, and you'll start back up in 2.9.1 environment. I'm gonna cancel for now. And if you are in the 2.91 environment, this button will say switch to EOS 3.0, and that will allow you to come back to the other software. This is for consoles only and is not available with Nomad. All right, let's go look at Augmented. Hey, welcome back to the ETC R&D Bear Pit. Ever since we first showed Augmented, we've been letting out Feature of the Week videos, giving you previews of all the development features going into Augmented. 
The model used in those videos was based on a real space here at the ETC factory, and we're here now to show you how it really works. Let's dig on in. The first thing we'll want to do is pull in our model, so I'm going to go into my edit mode, and I can import over 50 different 3D file extensions into Augmented. I'm going to grab the model of the bear pit that I imported in, drop it into the space, and there it is, ready to navigate, ready to hang lights. The next thing I'm going to want to do is bring in my fixtures, and we've got a couple of different ways you can do that. The first one is bringing in our fixtures through the Vectorworks plugin. So I'm going to come over to my Vectorworks machine and in Spotlight hit Export to Augmented. I'm going to save that on my thumb drive. And that's it. So now if you've spent a ton of time drafting and bringing your fixtures into Vectorworks, you can simply pull out the thumb drive and import them into Augmented. And as you can see, we brought in our fixture model. I'm going to hit Done to leave here. I'm going to apply those changes. The other place I can make adjustments to my fixtures is to go into my patch. And if I go into my augmented section, I can grab a channel, and it shows me and allows me to change my XYZ position and my orientation degree information. We have tools for pointing conventionals as well, not just moving lights. Let's say, for example, that I'm going to take out these movers. And if I say 101 at full, in my model, that fixture is pointed at the staircase. But in my reality, that fixture is pointed straight down. So I'm going to find fixture 101. And I'm going to select it. I can drag that fixture to be where it is in reality. And now, my model matches my reality, even with my static fixtures. There's always more than one way to do something in EOS. Let's find out how to learn a rig from the positions we have in the real space. If I walk into a space that already has fixtures in the air, I can use the fixture position estimation tool to use some focus palettes to reverse calculate where those fixtures are in space. So as you can see, I've got 21 through 23 in my real space. They're on the floor in my model, like they've just been loaded in. And right before you all got here, I focused these fixtures to five different focus palettes. So the best way to do that is to take your iris all the way down as tight as it'll go. And what I recorded was all of my fixtures at that position, another at that position, another at that position, another at that position. And four is good, but sometimes if you want to add a bit more accuracy, you can record a fifth location. And all of these were just easy to find locations in my space. If you look at my model space in Augmented, you can see I've placed focus positions at each of those corners, and you can't see the one that's underneath my light. So with all of those in place, I'm going to go into Patch. And I'll select my channels again. And in my Augmented section, I have a header called FPE. We use different sets of FPE so that if you have fixtures that can't all get to the same place, you can set up multiple sets. But as you can see, I placed the FPE points where they are in my model in real space. And now that the model knows where those focus points are and my fixtures have been pointed to them, I can use the Recalculate FPE button. And it's going to show me positional information after it recalculates them. I'll hit Apply. And now in my model space, they're where they're actually hung in real space. Look, everybody, it's my good buddy, Rob Crane. Hey, Rob. Hi, Nick. Hey, I see you're logged into the system. Can you hop over and fix those focus palettes before we do the next shot? Sure thing. All right, I'll see you in a few. I'm going to adjust these focus palettes for Nick using the RFR app. To make this work, I've printed out a few AR targets. These are images I can scan from within the app which allows Augmented to know the actual position of my mobile device in relationship to the model and to my fixtures. We have several of these AR targets located around the space and have placed each target at the same location within the model. These can be placed anywhere in your model, including in conspicuous locations, like here on the upstage side of a column. Once I'm scanned in, Augmented knows the 3D position of my phone in the real space. If I look up in my rig, I will now see a gold box around each of my selected fixtures. I can deselect or reselect from there. I've got all three selected now. I can swipe up for intensity, swipe down, swipe up. I can also pinch to zoom 
if my fixtures have zoom ability. And then I can use the wand feature to use my phone as a pointer. I can come here, or swing over here, and put those fixtures anywhere in my space that I want to. I can also use the find me feature and hit the button, and those fixtures are gonna come right to the phone. Hey Nick, let's record some more focus palettes. Let's get one over here. Got it. Got it. We're good. One of the great things about having my fixtures and my model in my augmented space is that I can get a really good idea of what's going on in reality, even if I'm not in the space or I'm not able to look at my stage. So uh, I can really quickly grab my fixtures and click to focus is a great way to use the surfaces that are in my space so I can record a focus palette there and I can uh, come back over and I'm going to select those fixtures and move them up here and I'm going to record that as a focus palette right there. I'm going to grab those fixtures again. I'm going to come down to this space and I'm going to click to focus and I'm going to record them as a focus palette there. So I can be super fast and efficient regardless of whether I'm in my space or not. There's a lot of fixture and beam identification tools that are in Augmented that can help make your session even more expeditious. In our labels area, we have the ability to show fixture labels, beam center labels, or focus handles, and this allows us to select only specific types of fixtures. The labels that are shown represent the type of data that's available, like manual, submaster, or stored. Stick beams allow me to see what my fixtures are doing, and I'm gonna select just selected, so that when I grab my channels, 21 through 23, they're at full currently. If I put them out, click to focus on a different part of my set, and then slam them up, they're where I want them, and I was able to see them make the change in the dark. I can also turn on focus handles, which allow me to drag beams in my model, and they're really good for preserving a shape that I've laid out. So I'm gonna turn on my focus handles, and really quickly, I'm gonna hit next, and take just that channel, spread it over here, next, do that there, next, grab that channel there. And now if I select all of them again, they're gonna to continue to move together as a single shape. This is really great for fans and hombres that you just need to get further upstage. There are lots of other display settings that are available to you, so go ahead and check out your training materials and see what they're all about. Sometimes I need to make that difficult to make shot and I just wanna see what my light's up to. I'm gonna select my channel 21 and in my camera area, turn on fixture point of view. And now that I have that there, I'm gonna pan this fixture around, tilt it up, and I can notch into that super hard to reach spot with pinpoint precision. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us for this preview of EOS 3.0, now with Augmented, and thanks to Rob for helping me show it off. Sure thing, happy to help. As a reminder, we did film these videos during our open beta period, so there could be some changes to the software between when we filmed this and when the software gets into your hands. So please check out our documentation and videos on our website. Sounds good. And don't forget to look for our education videos to learn about all the features in ES 3.0, including Augmented. And if you're excited about what we've brought you in this software release, can't wait for you to see us at the next one. Have a good one.